All right, so it is a great pleasure to uh, introduce to you Professor Isaac O'Hain from Harvard University. He is the inaugural chair of the Department of Biomedical Informatics and the Marion V. Nelson Professor of Biomedical Informatics at Harvard Medical School. He develops and applies computational techniques to address disease at multiple scales from whole healthcare systems as living laboratories to the functional genomics of neural development with a focus on autism. Kohane's I2B2 project is currently deployed internationally to over 120 major academic health centers. He has published several, several hundred papers in the medical literature and authored a widely used book on microarrays for an integrative genomics. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine and the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Uh, we are thrilled to have him here with us today, and he'll be talking about active human machine integrations necessary for interpretability. Professor Quayne, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. A uh, quick sound check. Can you hear me well? Indeed, we can hear you very well. Very good. Uh, so first of all, thank you for that kind introduction. Let me just add the part that I think perhaps is most relevant to uh, this conversation, which is... Um, I, have, I was trained in pediatric endocrinology, but I also have a PhD in computer science. And my thesis was on artificial intelligence during the second heyday. We're now in the third heyday of artificial intelligence where, uh, and that was uh, during the period of uh, the dominance of the symbolic and expert system driven uh, perspective on, um, uh, on uh, artificial intelligence. And so I'm really glad to be able to uh, tell you about how my thinking has evolved about this, but very specifically on the central issue that you've invited me to speak about, which is uh, interpretability uh, in service of a trustworthy AI. And I hope to be um, both uh, entertaining and informative by uh, bringing you along in my thinking and let me say that um, I've purposefully uh, given myself a fair amount of um, buffer time so that if there's questions at the end, there's definitely time for questions, but there's also going to be time for people to interrupt me if they have a burning question. I certainly don't mind. Uh, Anders, please just interrupt me and I'll be, I'll be glad to, to do this. And I find that this, this medium gets a lot more less dreary um, if we uh, allow for interruptions. So now the critical thing is, can I get PowerPoint to work? Let's see. Uh, let's see, and now let's try to share, whoops, share screen. Is your seven done, unfortunately. Let's share screen. Desktop. Two. Sure. Okay. Anders, does it look like I'm sharing my screen or, or not? Absolutely. I think you are sharing the screen indeed. Do you see my uh, title screen? Yes. Uh, oops, now it went black and said, so now we're back. Okay, good. Yep. All right. Or let me see. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes or no? Uh, it, it, so we have uh, what we have now is that we have to the left what doctors and patients really want, uh, and then we have to the right it says next slide disclosure. Oh, that's not good. How about this time now? Ah, I think that's exactly the one we want. All right. Says, Excellent. Yes, what doctors and patients really want. All right. Good. So that's exactly what I'll be talking to you about. What uh, doctors and patients really want and need rather than interpre interpretability. And what I will argue is that although interpretability is an important research goal, it's remarkably unimportant to the task of um, providing safe, useful care and it is a functionality that very few will be uh, interested in and it will not be effective in improving acceptance and reliance upon machine learning tools 
um, for a variety of reasons that I will uh, elaborate. All right, first of all, important disclosures. I'm on uh, the bo corporate board of several uh, companies. I'm on the scientific advisory board of uh, several other uh, groups, but I have to say that um, I'm a strong believer that, although we have to be transparent in our disclosures, the biggest disclosures are the ones that are not made, which are the disclosures of the dark matter of academia, which is your own belief and your own hypotheses. And I think these bias us far more than any um, financial conflict of interest, not least of which is because ultimately they lead to financial benefits potentially. To level the playing field, I wanna make sure that we're talking about uh, the same thing. So I'm casting a rather um, broad landscape when I talk about machine learning and art or artificial intelligence. I show here a um, diagram that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2018 with my colleague, Andrew Beam, himself a machine learning uh, uh, and healthcare expert at the Harvard School of Public Health. And the point we wanted to make is that if you see, if you look at this diagram, uh, there's two axes. There's an axis of data size going from uh, 10 to the zero to 10 to the 10. And here um, shown by this increasingly on the y-axis with increasingly small human silhouettes is the decreased involvement of human beings in the development or specification of the models, and conversely, the increased automation of the specification of the model, such that in this um, spectrum from a lot of human knowledge to pure machine learning, we see somewhere here in the middle where I've put, in, put this um, red box are the tools that we thought that some don't think of as machine learning or artificial, or artificial intelligence, but are actually much more closely related than we'd like to acknowledge. Things like the um, risk calculator, such as the Framingham Heart Risk Score, um, which are um, machine learning models, logistic regression, where uh, the data drives the value of the coefficients. But here, there's a lot of human involvement in specification of which variables are included in the model. And I note that because there are very few um, variables in these models, they tend to be um, fairly transparent in terms of their interpret interpretability. Um, on the other extreme are programs such as uh, AlphaGo, where it can play millions of games and develop against itself and develop thereby um, a very high performance model, but it's not necessarily the most directly human interpretable um, uh, model, but that's not the point that I'm trying to make here. But having then established that uh, we're not talking, <clears throat> excuse me, about um, a arbitrary bright line between artificial intelligence and machine learning and previous uh, data-driven models, uh, let's proceed to a great example of interpretability. Here you see on your screen um, a highlight from a paper that appeared in the in uh, NeurIPS in last year's uh, NeurIPS uh, proceedings. This is, I believe, a extended poster um, done by uh, my former uh, postdoctoral student uh, and now uh, eminent professor at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University, Finale Doshi. And what they did using a uh, reinforce, reinforcement learning framework was to look at intensive care unit data and to identify using a probabilistic model, a Markov model, the multiple decision points where understanding the state of the patient was highly associated with a multiplicity of decisions. In other words, faced with the same patient state, doctors 
would have a lot of variance or lack of concordance about what decisions they would take. And this would be a useful technique for um, developers of machine learning models in the ICU to allow them to focus on those parts of the decision task in the ICU of taking care of these patients where there was a lot of human disagreement and therefore perhaps worthy of increased uh, attention and focus in the use of machine learning algorithms. And indeed, I would say that interpretability is absolutely essential for debugging models. In other words, understanding how a machine learning model came to a conclusion, whether it be a diagnostic classification, whether it be a prediction, understanding <clears throat> how it did so is going to be really important in understanding the, for the developer <clears throat> of this machine learning model, how robust the performance is, where it may fall down, and where it may need additional training data, for example. In machine learning models used in discovery uh, science, having a interpretability um, module or capability is gonna be very important to understand, for example, if I have a machine learning model that allows me to um, infer the somatic, the, the state of somatic mutations in um, normal human tissue based on deep sequencing of these tissues to see which of those tissues may end up becoming cancerous or not. Understanding how that, that data-driven model based on thousands of samples, how that machine learning model arrives at its conclusion may be very important in understanding uh, cancer biology. Furthermore, it actually might show you the limitations of your model and then allow you to say, perhaps there's something incomplete about my hypothesis. Let's say there's something incomplete about my hypothesis about carcinogenesis that has been inferred from these large scale genomic data. Perhaps I should be thinking about other hypotheses. That's a very, very valuable use of interpretability. But the question I would ask you, and I certainly I've asked myself, is how important is interpretability for the performance of clinical medicine? <clears throat> and how likely is it that high state-of-the-art performance in interpretability is going to increase adoption of machine learning models in healthcare, or frankly, in any other runtime application domain? And will it help um, increase a sense of comfort in the use of these models? And so let's be clear. We're not talking about interpretability for science. We're not in talking about interpretability for debugging of your models. We are not talking about interpret interpretability for developing of new hypotheses. What we're speaking narrowly about, actually a very large domain, that is interpretability during clinical care. You have a machine learning pro program an a, or if you want to be fancy, an AI agent acting within the healthcare system to provide decision support to the patient or to the doctor. Let's call that the runtime package for clinicians. This is not the training. This is the runtime package for clinicians. And by the way, although I'm not going to go there today, I would argue that there are many other analogous runtime packages in multiple domains which have the same characteristics with regard to the uh, lack of uh, value slash importance of interpretability. 
I want to uh, bring you back uh, to uh, a rather tense moment in our continuing tense pandemic. Um, and I'm all the way, all the more aware, given the fact that uh, I have a large collaboration across nine countries in looking at the electronic health record of patients across nine countries and 300 hospitals where we're looking at COVID, all too aware of what you are going through in the UK. But nonetheless, let me bring you back to uh, spring of 2020. In the spring of 2020, we were with good justification worried that the rise in cases with COVID, and remember this time pre-vaccine, that the rise in cases were going to overwhelm our capacity in hospitals to be able to take care of our patients in the intensive care units. And this was not a theoretical uh, issue. There were a few hospitals, particularly in New York City, that were over, way over capacity and way over capacity, not in just in physical space, but in the availability of expert intensivists. This, by the way, echoed the experience, for example, in Italy, in Northern Italy, uh, a month before. And so it was a completely reasonable uh, thought to say, given the imminent overwhelming of our intensive care units throughout the United States, can we use machine learning, given all the data that we have from these electronic health records that we have literally invested billions of dollars in over the last 10 years, can we use all that data to predict who is going to be sicker as they present in the emergency room? Who is going to get sicker? Who is going to become so ill that they're going to require the ICU so that we can implement one of several impressively bad, impressively not bad, dire uh, triage scenarios. One, uh, take those who are predicted to be most, will be most sick and bring them to the ICU early. Or if the ICU is overwhelmed, take those who are predicted to die no matter what and perhaps do more palliative care. So the algorithms, several groups developed algorithms. Most notably was an algorithm developed by the largest electronic health record uh, vendor, electronic health record vendor, certainly in the United States, perhaps worldwide, Epic Systems. And by virtue of their um, co-opting of the um, leadership of the hospitals that they're involved with, because when you buy an Epic system, you're committing yourself to several hundred million dollars of uh, investment per healthcare system. So there's a, a great deal of, uh, of uh, collaboration between the, the company and the um, hospital leadership. And so they were able to reach out to hospital leader, leadership said, we have access to your data as per our standard contract. May we use those data to develop a machine learning model to predict who is going to die and who, who is going to get very sick and who's not going to get very sick. And indeed, they developed such a model. And furthermore, the performance of it across a moderately large group of hospitals was impressive. Areas under the curve, uh, under the receiving operating characteristic curve, well above 80%, maybe uh, as high as 90%. So it looks pretty good. But then there was a publication that appeared in the Annals of American Thoracic Society, which uh, suggested that the performance in other hospitals using the same kind of data from their electronic health record, the performance was far inferior to that of the algorithm as originally uh, published and deployed, actually deployed and 
this is not a thought experiment. They actually deployed in some of these hospitals the algorithm, which was used at least to look at what the predicted uh, morbidity was of the patients. And furthermore, there was another paper which appeared, which said that not only was the performance of the algorithm different in different hospitals in the same country, the United States, but a few months down the line, same year, the nature of the disease, given the change in populations, given the change in therapies, not least of which were done or changed because of the amazing United Kingdom effort, which resulted in our understanding that dexamethasone was a cheap and most effective therapy, the predictive value of that algorithm got, became so poor that the original site where it was developed switched off the algorithm because it was giving consistently incorrect advice. Now, with my colleagues, uh, Jonathan Citrine at the Harvard Law School um, and uh, several others, we published a paper in um, the New England, data, New England Journal of Medicine called uh, The Clinician and Data Set, Set Shift in Artificial Intelligence, where we talked about the, the fact that because healthcare changed, because populations changed, because regulations changed, because uh, medications changed, there was going to be a great deal of assumptions underlying the models that may no longer be true. And in the same um, article that appeared in July of last year, we uh, tendered several um, mitigation strategies that might um, decrease the exposure, the risk of the healthcare system to the effect of data shift. Now I wanna point out that none of our recommendations had anything to do with interoperability. And why is that? It's because the fundamental nature of what was known to the model the closed world assumption that exists in most of these models meant that fundamentally the model was incomplete. There's no way it could interpret, it could introspect in any part of its model and explain to the clinician why its predictions were going to be wrong. Now, in if you are willing to posit a artificial general intelligence, AGI um, functionality, which we do not have today, then perhaps we could have this um, robot or AGI agent looking at all the literature and seeing what's happening uh, with the medications and then automatically uh, healing its, out, its model to um, bring, bring it up to date. But short of that vast leap, of performance, there is no interpretability here that could help. We'll get back to that. Let me give you another uh, vignette. I was visited by a very smart and smartly dressed CEO from a Silicon Valley company. He had been an undergrad at MIT. And his Silicon Valley company had done already quite a lot of business with Google. And was now, he was now visiting the East Coast of the United States because he had several deals uh, that were uh, being consummated with the, some insurance plans in uh, Boston and the rest of the East Coast to uh, use his machine learning model to help them stratify patients, to find patients in need, to be able to predict what was going to happen in the healthcare system. And because uh, I was local and I'm, I, I chair this department at, at Harvard uh, University, he just wanted to see what we were doing. And so I told him about a study that was led by one of our faculty, uh, Griffin Weber, whose icon I show you in the top right corner. And I said, we've done a study 
And we've done a study across multiple hospitals where we looked at hundreds of different laboratory values. And we were able to come up with machine learning models that, accurately, that predicted what your mortality would be or survival would be after three years after the test was taken. And I'm illustrating here, and I illustrated to this well-dressed, snappily dressed CEO, the following uh, fraction of the study for one of those hundreds of laboratory tests, namely the white blood cell count. And I said to him, could you explain to me why, if you have the misfortune to be like me, white, male, between age 50 and 69 years, and your white blood count is low between 12 a.m. and 8 a.m., your chance of death in the next three years is greater than 56%, whereas the same low white blood count done between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. is less than, associated with less than 3% of chance, chance of death in the next three years. And he thought about it, he's a sort of smart, smart young man. And he said, well, maybe it's a circadian rhythm. And I told him, you're missing the big picture. And I've shown this graph to many individuals and it's only the, um, I would say, the youngish clinicians who are really involved with healthcare who immediately understand. And it is that if a doctor is inserting a needle into your vein at three o'clock in the morning, it's because they are very worried about your healthcare. They don't sadistically want to wake you up at three o'clock in the morning to draw your blood. It's because they are thinking that you're in immediate danger and they're drawing the blood. So in fact, regardless of what is actually being measured and regardless certainly of what the value of the white blood count is, you are in deep trouble just by virtue of having that blood drawn at three o'clock in the morning. Whereas if it's four o'clock in the afternoon, it's a routine outpatient blood draw and therefore the associated risk is very small. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that there are two models. One is the model that our colleague, our CEO from this uh, uh, Silicon Valley company was very aware of, the patient model. What is, what, are, what is the patient physiology? What he did not understand, what his model was not just capturing patient physiology, it was actually also capturing the behavioral physiology of the healthcare system. In other words, when a blood test was being done, was being informed by a healthcare assessment, a judgment on the part of the human using non-artificial general intelligence as to the healthcare state. And by conflating those two different, um, those two different models, the patient physiology and the behavior of the healthcare system, what we call healthcare system dynamics. And by the way, we published this in the British Medical Journal several years ago, if you're interested in the details of the study. Um, so unless you, you um, understand that difference, your predictions are gonna be way off. To him and his model, the difference between a three o'clock in the morning versus four o'clock in the afternoon um, prediction, the, the variance that we just noted, is a matter of noise, which is actually a major mistake because it's not noise, this is bias. There is true difference in the underlying models that is causing that difference. Yet, there is nothing in his model that would account for it, and therefore any amount of interpretation would completely miss why it was wrong and what the value was. And as I show in this graph, where you see on the x-axis, the odds ratio of death, and the, on the y-axis, how much additional information is brought by the test, I can, we can tell you that over half of all the lab values 
or the lab tests rather, not lab values, over half, more than half of all the lab values. It was more information on when the, the test was done on the healthcare system dynamics than on the actual value of the lab test. And of course, if you combine them both, if you use both the health system dynamics, HSD, and the lab value, then of course you have imp improved performance. But I want to point out that when the model was incomplete, as the model always will be for the foreseeable future, interpretability is not going to be particularly useful. And it's here where we have to ask ourselves, who of the stakeholders knows if the representation in the machine learning model is sufficiently capacious for useful interpretability? And by the way, I am, again, just focusing on the runtime delivery of healthcare. But parenthetically, I believe the same issues are true of a number of other highly complex real world runtime application domains. And so in the two examples that I just showed you, who knows whether, whether the model is complete enough and sufficient for interpretability to be useful in all the important cases that we care about. So for example, payers might, whether it's the UK government or a private insurer um, in uh, the United States, they may care about the socioeconomic status of the patient as relates to outcome, which is actually a perfectly reasonable and often validated um, a parameter, but not present in many published models. Uh, patient advocates may also have a different set of considerations in what is useful in the interpretability of the, and therefore that is explanation and justification of the model. And dissatisfaction when the concerns that they have, when the informants of decisions that they are concerned about are absent from the model. And so I just show you this picture to disabuse those of us who think we can just take the data that we have out of convenience, whether electronic health record or claims data or self-reported data, and think that somehow that serves that data-driven models of those from those data serve as a sufficient substrate to create useful interpretability from it in real-time delivery. Furthermore, I wanna point out that we have lots of evidence from the actual delivery of healthcare throughout the world that opacity in healthcare decision-making is accepted with equanimity from millions of healthcare providers. So I will tell you with great confidence that the machines that de deliver these images of the inside of our body, whether it's CT scans or MRIs, are only able to do so because of the deconvolution algorithms that are present in the computers that develop the image from the uh, sensed magnetic resonance or um, x-rays. I would be, I would place a very significant bet that not more than 1% of doctors understand the deconvolution algorithm that drives these pictures. And yet we use them confidently and yet we bill for them uh, generously. And why is it that we, so this is a big application domain, a big chunk of medicine, no interpretability other than here's an image. There's no justification, no explanation of how the image was generated. Unless you say, well, it's obvious that the image speaks for itself. That's the interpretation. That's not the case. Here I show you what is literally called in radiology, UBOs, unidentified bright objects. 
And what you'll see is uh, around a imaging station, you'll see a bunch of young or old men or women or others pulling their chin and saying, hmm, that's either something that I need to worry about or it's just an artifact. And the basis on which they do that is a very slim evidentiary base. And they certainly don't understand for the most part, the details of how that image was generated. Lest you not be impressed by that example, let me try to impress you with another example. Routinely, if someone is on a basketball court and they're running along and they pass out and they don't feel that well and maybe their EKG looks a little funky, they'll be sent in the UK or the United States to a uh, cardiologist, well, first a primary care practitioner and then a, a cardiologist. And if that history is evinced, um, they will likely order a panel of tests, genetic tests for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a disease which has been famously responsible for se several awful and spectacular deaths on the basketball court and in various athletic uh, venues where a young, apparently healthy individual drops dead. And so there is an enormous need to be able to understand who is at risk. And so we have developed these panels of genetic tests where mutations in these genes have been found to be associated with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And because this disease is what's called autosomal dominant, that is, if you have a variant, you don't need two copies of the mutation, just one copy will do. If you are found to have such a variant, not only will you be uh, examined, but all your family will be because the chance of you sharing it, that variant with other family members, since this autosomal dominant is very high, and therefore they are too are at risk, and they to have to be worked up. And that's problematic, or at least a high stakes uh, clinical decision, because if you're found in fact to have a pathogenic variant, you will have, you're at high risk of having a implantable defibrillator inserted into your body to uh, remove the arrhythmia from your heart through a, um, electric shock, which certainly if you have that arrhythmia and you have this propensity to uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it should be of grave concern and worth doing. But then with uh, my then graduate student, now Professor uh, Arjun Manrai, we published the New England Journal of Medicine in 2016, a study where we looked at this disease, this disease that is supposed to be in one in 500 patients. And we looked at all the, um, variants that were uh, supposed to be causing uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we found that not in one in 500, but in some cases in 10% of a certain population, these variants were present. So how could it be that these variants that are supposedly causing hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, autosomal dominant disease, would in fact have a frequency of 10% when the disease itself is only one in 500? Uh, well, I don't have time to go into the story, although you can read the New England Journal article from 2016, but I'll summarize it for you saying, because of a misunderstanding of how genetic analysis is done, African-Americans, actually, sorry, not african -Americans, anybody with African ancestry, whether it be uh, a Frenchman, uh, of Alger whose grandfather was Algerian or a, an American woman uh, who had um, some uh, African uh, ancestry, they would be mistakenly diagnosed as having hypertrophic, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because they carried a variant that's actually common in, African in Africans and not pathogenic, but just as absent from those of us who were more recently uh, from 
Europe. And we actually showed how multiple, in a top laboratory, multiple African-Americans were misdiagnosed and put through the ringer I just described. And this is a kind of machine learning where we go through large data sets and try to come up with probabilities. And there's no way that any interpretation would have caught this. So I think part of what's the problem is that those of us, even those of us who are, who are trained as doctors, even though we're computer scientists too, but certainly those of us who, who, whose experience have been limited to computer science have this, um, I think, idealized view of medicine where this expert infectious disease uh, person, let's say this woman on the right, is approached by this uh, generalist on the left and he's asking her for expertise. Should I, um, should I in fact use the special antibiotic on this patient or should I uh, be implanting this defibrillator? And discussing the case from the you know, first principles to see if indeed um, the data suggests appropriately that a intervention should be done. Well, I will put aside the fact that this interaction, although it does happen, is rare, and it's not clear that it's the interaction that we want to emulate, especially not given the current performance of machine learning um, programs. So I'd like to, for you to consider instead the uh, real nature of the, the role the physician has in the loop of decision-making and how we are absolutely obligated at this point to partition, partition off the tasks that relate to artificial, artificial general intelligence versus the machine learning that we can do today. And what do I mean by that? This is work done by um, two of my postdocs, um, uh, Brett Bolio-Jones and William Yuan. And we published this in Nature Digital Medicine uh, earlier this year. And what we were doing, we're looking at some tasks that Google had published about how it was able to use electronic health record data to publish, to predict a number of healthcare outcomes directly from the electronic health record data. That was very, very impressive. But when we looked more closely at it, it became clear that what these machine learning algorithms were doing were very much what like I, as an eager to please, um, ambitious young clinician might have done, which is if I were sitting in the emergency room with an attending physician, the expert, and the expert, as the patient come in, ordered a D-dimer, a measure of coagulation, and this patient was complaining of chest, uh, chest pain. Well, I've read the textbook, so I know D-dimer. I'd say, doctor, I believe uh, the patient might be at risk of um, pulmonary embolism because the doctor ordered the test because that's exactly what she's worried about. And then the doctor orders a chest X-ray. I'd say, doctor, I really think that um, it's getting much more likely given the D-dimer that um, this patient has a uh, pulmonary embolus. And then the doctor orders a chest CT. I said, doctor, doctor, I am really worried about this patient. I really believe this patient is, is, is having a pulmonary embolus now. And then the chest CT results come back and I say, doctor, you see, I was right. There was this pulmonary embolus. And of course, this young student irritating that doctor had zero diagnostic ability at, at all. I was just keying off the fact that I had textbook knowledge and I was using the behavior of the doctor to guide me into um, what I was predicting that was going on with the patient. How does this relate to the Google task? Very, let's understand what, where the data is coming from. What you see here is a care path, which goes from the patient physiology to the belief the physician has about the patient to the physician's actions, which then of course, have their uh, impact on the 
uh, patient's physiology. The physiology is faithfully reported in part by routine tele telemetry. The physician's beliefs are shown by the electronic medical record data to the extent that the doctor records what they think is going on. And the physician actions are um, reflected both in the electronic medical record data and in the charge details. Certainly in the United States, we have a separate data stream about all the things that we've done so that we can actually bill for it. And so what you see at, as you have uh, this history of the patient, as you go through this day of, um, let's say, myocardial infarction, we have all these physiological processes and then this change in the belief of the doctor in, in that there is some myocardial infarction like uh, process because for example, an uh, uh, abnormal troponin is, is there. And then we have a bunch of physician actions. And so we ask ourselves, if we don't look at the patient, if we just look at the physician actions, how well could we do exactly what Google did and the answer is, if we look at charge master, this is the physician actions versus the electronic medical record, which is, includes not only actions, but the beliefs, we actually find for predictions of, um, predictions of uh, mortality, readmission, or length of stay, we're very, very close to the, the performance of the EHR-driven program. That is, just looking at the physician's um, performance gives us most of the accuracy we need. And so therefore, if we remove the clinician or we put in a less expert clinician, the performance of these systems will degrade substantially. And that's not obvious anywhere in the model and therefore the interpretability is going to necessarily suffer. And I'm gonna just go glance by this slide because I realize I'm running out of time. I do want us to have time for questions. And I just this is just to point out that the more narrow the task, the better the machine learning algorithm did. And, but the broader the task, the worse it did. So let me uh, sort of close out with a quick story. Um, Several years ago, my, uh, my then uh, nine-year-old mother was admitted to the hospital, uh, the Brigham Women's Hospital, not too far from where I work, uh, in congestive heart failure. And she was admitted, and the only thing that was wrong was her heart was not pumping well enough, and therefore her fluid was accumulating in her body, and most importantly, was beginning to flood her lungs. She was also extremely uncomfortable because her legs were swollen with uh, the fluid that was accumulating in the legs painfully, painful edema. And so uh, they, in, they couldn't give her oral Lasix, which she had been getting from her doctor because it just would not be effective enough. So she, they gave her intravenous Lasix, a diuretic. She peed out all that fluid and she returned home happily. Unfortunately, a few weeks later, she returned to the hospital in the same state. And um, this time she was so weakened by the admission and stay that they had to send her to re uh, rehabilitation for several weeks in order to be able to return home where she lives on her own, where she lived on her own. And at that point, I realized that she was gonna die if, I, if we didn't do something. And it's not like she didn't have a great doctor. She had a very, very competent, highly attentive uh, clinician, but it wasn't doing the trick. And so then I took upon myself something that I would not recommend to everybody, but I felt I had no choice which is I did something that we knew for a fact, randomized controlled trials would not, uh, had, that randomized controlled trials showed had not been effective. What I did is I bought my mother a scale, this one marketed by Fitbit, that plugs into your Wi-Fi network and allows you, in this case, me, to see on the cloud what my mother's weight is. And I would call her every morning to see what her weight was. Sorry, uh, I would call her every morning just to check in with her. And based on what her, her weight was, I would tell her what to do. So I actually wrote this up for our local radio station, uh, our national public radio station, WBUR, in a tongue-in-cheek uh, uh, entitled articles, What My 90-Year-Old Mother Taught Me About the Future of AI in Healthcare. And I described this uh, algorithm that I implemented for my mother. 
So see here is, this is what the data stream I would see on the, on the cloud based on my mother's um, weight. And I would see every once in a while this blip up in the weight. And it might've been because perhaps that day her heart was not working so well or more likely because she had had a dietary indiscretion. She wanted to have perhaps more of a pretzel, more uh, salted meat, and she retained more uh, salt. And so every time I saw that, I would call her up and I'd say, mom, or actually since I grew up in Geneva with British teachers, I'd say, mommy, could you please take an additional pill of Lasix? Now, I'm trained as a pediatrician. I've never taken care of heart failure patients since at least since, since 30 years ago or 40 years ago in medical school, but what choice did I have? She was you know, on death's door. And so I kept on doing this. Now, initially it was very, very, very rough going because my mother is, I think, appropriately uh, suspicious of uh, healthcare. And so she said, why should I take a pill? I said, mom, your heart, your weight went up and money is going to keep on going up unless you take the pill. So she continued, uh, finally, she would take the pill. And as you can see, I could reduce her weight down to normal. And so what happened, instead of having her um, legs become fat as tree trunks, they stayed thin. And I kept her out of the hospital for years after those two admission, admissions. Uh, there she is, and that's me when I got my professorship. Um, and, I'd like you to reflect on the fact, what was it in here that worked? It was who was completing the loop in decision-making? Me. And it turns out that she had a great doctor, but even whether it was he or a nurse, were they trusted by mother, my mother? Would they do what she said? Would they have enough um, forcefulness to say, you know, I don't think you took the Lasix pill yesterday. I think you need to take it now. So the trust is not the trusting in the AI algorithm that, that I told you about. My fancy algorithm, if weight is up two pounds, take an additional pill the next day. And it's about integrating with the rest of healthcare. I was communicating with everybody in the healthcare system so they knew what was going on. Who sees process automation? Was there an accurate measurement? I was a technical support on this. And then what happened one day, I, it occurred to me that my mother's weight had been declining for a few uh, weeks. And at first I congratulated myself on a job very well done. I was even getting better. But then I realized like any, not any, like most doctors, I was not listening to the patient. She had been telling me that she was getting up at night to pee. And I just dismiss it, you know, old age, it's not, it's, not, it's not a party. And in fact, what it was, was that her blood sugar was going up. She had previously not been diabetic, but she was getting apparently diabetic. And, I ha and by virtue of the, this uh, uh, glycosuria, she was losing calories and weight and I was missing it. And so I quickly realized at that point that I missed the boat, put her on metformin and she started getting weight back. So my model was wrong. The interpretability was lacking and clearly interesting, but beside the point. And so I will just close there and say, I think interpret interpretability is an interesting and important AI task, but I hope I convince you that there are many other tasks around trustworthy AI, which are far more important than the issue of interpretability that we have not addressed well enough until today. So I hope this stimulates some dis discussion, some questions either today or in the future and allow me to uh, shamelessly put in a plug where we have two searches going on for assistant professors in our department, one in the area, uh, area of computational biology and genomics, a, a fine machine learning application domain, and the other in precision healthcare. And I'll stop there and I'll ask questions. Uh, I'll welcome any questions uh, in the time remaining.